Okay. So uh, here at Seattle Atheist Church, the members ourselves give most of the talks, uh, though today we have a special guest speaker. Uh, we have a quarterly planning meeting where the members uh, plan out everything that's going to happen. And if you are here, then you are very welcome to join that um, meeting and make suggestions for talks you would like to hear. So today we have special guest, Dr. Nicholas Brigham, epistemologist, sociologist, and technologist uh, behind the Goodly Labs. He's going to be talking about how we know, building confidence in our information ecosystem. Uh, Dr. Brigham, uh, you have the floor. Okay, um, everyone can hear me, yes? Great, uh, well, thank you so much for having me. I, I feel really honored to be here. Um, uh, this has been a really fun assignment. I'm glad that Abraham I am connected all of us um, because there are some ideas I've had about epistemology, how we know things. Um, some ideas I've been having for a long time that I finally got to put down on the page. Uh, thanks to this moment. So uh, the good news is this talk is very fresh and uh, the bad news is this talk is very fresh. <laughs> so um, I think we'll have a great discussion at the end because I suspect that I've, I've left some things a little too loose um, or, or you know, they're not quite clarified. So if, if you're listening in and, you're, and something doesn't quite make sense, please jot a note. It's gonna help everyone and it'll help me improve the talk going forward. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and jump in here. Um, I, you know, I was, I was talking with a few folks in the little breakout session about um, just the fact that this idea of an atheist church might seem paradoxical to some, but I think I understand it. Um, and I'm sure many of you do too, or you wouldn't be here. So we all understand the value of community that a church can provide even without some deist mythology. Um, but let me start twisting our minds immediately here. How sure am I of the proposition <laughs> that this makes sense? Or how sure am I about um, my, the proposition that you all understand how an atheist church makes sense? And how sure am I of any proposition? How sure can any of us be of any proposition? And by what cognitive processes can we really be sure of anything? Um, so I wanna explore, I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully going to land on some solutions because we are in kind of an epistemological crisis, but let's start by, by getting out of ourselves and out of our, our everyday notions of how we know things. Um, so to get our juices flowing, I'm gonna ask everyone to think about something that you believe strongly, just for a couple seconds. And notice if you can, the subjective experience of believing something, the certitude. You really believe this, you are very sure of this. And if you can, and maybe this has happened to you before, imagine the bafflement you might feel if hypothetically someone could somehow prove your belief wrong. It's like very surprising. I can't imagine how that could possibly be wrong. Um, now think about something that you find suspicious. Maybe it's some claim that's been floating out in the world and you don't buy it. You just kind of feel what that feels like. Maybe there's some tightening around the eyes. You're like literally squinting um, out of skepticism or some tightness on the shoulders and chest. And now think about something that you hypothesize to be true. You think it's probably true. How does that feel? A little exciting, a little curious, a little open. Um, and then of course, you know, beyond beliefs or things we might be suspicious of or things we might hypothesize, we can think about knowing something with certainty. I don't just believe it, I know it. This is not a matter of faith, I know it. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about epistemology, but classically, when folks have talked about epistemology, they tend to be talking about what is the best or optimal way to be sure that we know something. And we're gonna talk about that. But I just wanna make sure everyone's very in tune with the fact that there's a, there are subjective experiences about knowing 
that are not covered by the philosophical literature of how we should know. And there are all kinds of people out there feeling these subjective experiences of belief and knowledge, whether or not they're justified. Um, and they often feel just as strong, whether or not they're justified. Okay. Um, so we might think living in a Western civilization and being very canny, um, smart people who have encountered all kinds of zany ideas that we've rejected to the point that we are now in an atheist church ceremony. Um, we might think that knowledge is something that, uh, that especially Western civilization and science has figured out and, and feels pretty solid about. But actually, um, I'm, I'm here to tell you, I'm afraid, um, the literature on knowledge it actually is a literature that's mostly marked by incredible intellectual humility um, and skepticism about what we can know. Knowing is hardly a given, and it may not even be possible in some senses of the word. Um, and then by other senses or definitions of the word, it, it's possible, but just trivially easy um, and not really, you know, very impressive. You can just know something by a sheer act of will or faith. So within this audience at, at an atheist church, I'm confident many of you have turned over these questions before. So I'll, I'll try not to belabor, belabor anything too much, but I want, want to start with an exploration of epistemologies, um, these theories of how we know. And then I'll move on to discuss our current crisis in epistemology and what we might do about it. Um, first though, let me share a little background about me so you know who, where I'm coming from with this. Um, I've become fascinated with this topic and I will suggest later that knowing or striving to know is quite practical and requires no formal education, but questions of epistemology ha have been with me throughout my life and my formal education. Um, and they've played a significant role in my development as a thinker, as a sociologist, as a data scientist and a technology builder. These questions probably first emerged for me around questions of Christian faith, um, which probably is no surprise to the folks here in this room. Um, my father is now a, a kind of a semi-spiritual agnostic, but he was a rather fierce atheist when I was a child, probably because his mother tried too bluntly to force his belief in a Christian God. And then my mother, on the other hand, has always been kind of a seeker, a sort of pantheist interested in various spiritual traditions. Her father and my grandfather was a deacon in the Episcopal church. And when we would, when we'd visit my mom's place in the summers, we'd attend Sunday mass. And I really enjoyed the sweetness that was in those occasions, the, the peace be with yous and also with yous and the donuts, <laughs> they were very sweet. <laughs> but um, knowing, my, knowing uh, by a willful faith, like did not come easily to me. I couldn't just will myself to know something. Um, and I never really consented to a baptism or anything like that. Uh, by high school, my dad's nuclear family and I moved to Franklin, Tennessee, which is just south of Nashville, and I describe it as the buckle of the Bible Belt. Um, and I was too earnest to really engage in the hypocrisy of pretending that I was an evangelical Christian, like 98% of my peers. So as a consequence, I found myself in dozens of debates about the existence of God and the propriety of Christian dogmas. And I'm, I'm sure, as many of you know, those debates almost never really resolve because so many of the propositions from religion are um, what we would call unfalsifiable. That is, they cannot be proven wrong. There is no way to prove them wrong. There's no set of evidence that can prove wrong. Um, for example, you know, someone could say the earth was, the Bible says the earth was created 6,000 years ago and you can come through and say, oh, well, they've done carbon dating on dinosaur bones and it's definitely at least millions of years old and someone can, come back and say, well, the Lord works in mysterious ways and probably, you know, put those bones there just to confuse us and keep us, you know, there's always, there's always a story, an unfalsifiable theory of, of, of these Christian dogmas. So I debated these dogmas so much with people um, without ever really losing per se, but not really winning either. Um, but some teachers kind of saw this and suggested I major in philosophy upon entering college. So I did. And I studied the philosophy of science. Um, Karl Popper and Thomas Kuhn are kind of touchstones for me. But we started with the empiricists, uh, with George Barclay and Francis Bacon and John Locke, Rene Descartes, Leibniz, David Hume. Um, 
And I came away from all of this with, a, with a, an incredible kind of intellectual humility. Um, these thinkers' questions were really foundation for, foundational for the understanding of reality. And they even straddled into this, this world of metaphysics. They straddled that boundary between hard physical reality and the space of these unfalsifiable metaphysical propositions. They were trying to really get at what we can know. Um, so their grasping struggles really became mine. That was my intellectual. I just uh, up took that immediately. Um, and if I'm to boil down all of their works into a conclusion, it would it'd probably be the conclusion that truth with a capital T only exists in a very trivial sense or in a way that is too elusive for us to really fully apprehend. Um, it's something out there that we can't quite get. It's an asymptote that we can always approach but cannot reach. So students of logic may understand um, this, these ideas, these limits of truth with reference to the notions of deductive logic and inductive logic. So deductive logic um, generates truths based on some axioms that you assume to be true. If I assume these you know, two claims to be true, then I can deduce that these other things are true. So it becomes generative, but it relies on these assumptions. And a classic example of a deductive syllogism is Socrates is a man, all men are mortal. If we believe those things are true, then we can deduce that Socrates is mortal. Um, and you know you can do you can do this even more simply. You can just you can think of truth and deductive truth as as truth kind of by definition. So we could we could do something silly like we could create a brand new word. I'm going to go ahead and define a brand new word. Um, it's um, it's thelmotic has a weird spelling t h e l m o t i c thelmotic, and we're going to say that this means um, it's an adjective that describes species originating from the island of Crete. So here's a, here's a claim that's true now that we've made this definition. Species native to Crete are thelmotic. Bam, we just made something true. Um, but, you know, it's true, you know, we can know it's true, but it's kind of trivial. You know, anything I could define and then restate, I can say is true. Um, but what about this more specific claim? Once we start to move into act the actual world, not things that are just defined by our pretty language, but things that exist out in the world, things, everything gets very tricky very quickly. So here, here's a claim we can test. Lions are thelmotic. So how can we evaluate this? How can we prove it to be true or false? Um, the answer is, is not super easy. We could, we could attempt to amass evidence about the actual origin, origin of lions as a species, uh, but unfortunately, one of our friends could always come in uh, with a proposition that a god or gods actually invented the lion species uh, and has intentionally obscured its geographic origin. So we can't really know whether they're thelmotic or not. Or to use like a more modern example, someone could come in and say, well, we're all experiencing a simulated reality where nothing really exists at all. So these, unfalsifi these unfalsifiable claims if we admit that they're even possible, prevent us from saying with a certainty where lines originated from. You know, we can't, we can't disprove that unfalsifiable claim. And no matter how much evidence we have about where lines originated, now in our deliberation, there's like this shred of possibility that, that lines may, maybe, maybe they were originated on Crete or maybe we're in a simulation and it's all irrelevant. So these definitions, um, definitions, formal logic, math, even computer languages, they provide these systems for deriving and testing the truth of claims, given our assumptions that some of the claims are true by definition. So when we say two plus two equals four, um, we know that's true because we have narrowly defined the numerals two and four, and we've narrowly defined the operators plus and equal. So we could, right now, we could just decide that that little equal sign actually means uh, equal plus one. We could just define it that way. You're allowed to do this in math. And then two plus two really does equal five because it's two plus two. And then the equal sign now means equal plus one. Um, so this is the sense in which I mean the, the 
the truth of logic, of deductive logic and definition is kind of trivial. Um, that's not to say they can't be extremely useful. So the actual physical architecture of any church will support the claim that these, these relationships that we define um, and derive can be useful, but they have their limits. Um, so we could take the claim that the sky is blue. If we change the definition of blue to be synonymous with sky, we are certain that that is true. The sky is sky. <laughs> um, but uh, if we try to if we try to test the truth value of the claim that the sky is blue, it's again, it's not very easy. I was looking at the sky just last evening, and it did not appear blue. Um, it was blue two days ago when I looked, but I've seen it gray, purple, red, orange, yellow. It's even like kind of greenish sometimes. Um, so is it blue? I don't know. We could recall the wonderings of Leibniz uh, and Berkeley and, labor, and later um, Alfred Schutz, who are kind of this phenomenological tradition that, that bleeds into the American pragmatist tradition. You know, they would question whether there's even such a thing as blueness in the world outside the interpretation of our eyeballs and our brains. Um, and we don't know that. We, like, we cannot say that there is blueness in the world. We can say that we perceive something um, and then we can go to our friend and say like, what do you see? Does that color look different than that color? Okay, and we're gonna call this one blue. Um, so this sort of truth evaluation based on evidence where we're trying to evaluate the truth of something by looking into the world is what uh, people, folks since Aristotle have been calling induction or inductive reasoning. So you're not able to just derive true statements from other true statements. You have to kind of accrete evidence for or against propositions in this never ending process um, where you can never be absolutely 100% certain, but you can, you can kind of become, uh, you can become less wrong as some people say. So David Hume uh, really drew this hard line delimiting what we could know with certainty about our world. And the classic example from him is that he was observing that the ring, ringing of a bell at a factory near the end of the workday at least appeared to directly cause workers to pack up and go home. It happened with such regularity. It happened with the same regularity as like a billiard ball hitting another billiard ball. This bell would ring, people would pack up and go home. Um, but of course we know that bells alone do not force workers to finish their tasks and pack up their boxes and, and head out for the end of the day. And if we don't know that, how can we be absolutely certain that the force of a billiard ball really transfers to another through some certain causal physical process? This was David Hume's thought experiment. And we could translate that again into like the, the skeptical wrecking ball of today's metaphysics, um, this proposition that uh, we can't really know anything. We can't really know if any real energy or force is transferring because it's possible that we live in a simulation. You know, there aren't actually billiard, bar, billiard balls exchanging force. There's just a simulation. Um, and the appearance of that transfer of energy is only as real as the action in an animated film or a video game. Um, ultimately, Hume would suggest that knowledge about the workings of our empirical world cannot be known with certitude. And the business of all science is not to ascertain that truth with a capital T, but to amass evidence for the regularity of various events and relationships. Those could be physical, chemical, biological, or social. And the job of science is to systematically identify and then stop wasting time on <laughs> those propositions that consistently fail to garner evidence in the real world. Um, and in the pithy words of some of my colleagues, uh, philosophers and scientists should set their sights on the highest attainable goal of just becoming less wrong. Just become less wrong every day. You can never prove that you're right, but just get a little less wrong all the time. Um, so this was like, this learning this stuff, this is freshman year of college so long ago, I'm not gonna tell you how long ago, um, was kind of, devastating for me. I, I, you know, at the age of 15, I actually knew everything. It was one of my claims to fame at age 15. So accepting Hume's point of view was, was not just intellectually humbling. It was kind of like 
intellectually humiliating. <laughs> um, but this, the wholesale acceptance of Hume's really modest approach to inquiry, uh, its formalization by Francis Bacon and, and others has given us centuries of this very slow methodical science that gradually accretes like a whole library of likely truths and near certain falsehoods that we should ignore. Um, you know, even though these are never, never truths with a capital T or falsehoods with a capital F. There was something that was really underemphasized in this empiricism, however. There are actually two, two things that were underemphasized um, in my view. And here I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move out of like <laughs> old school philosophical literature review and I'm going to get a little more declarative. And I really invite everyone to, to jump in on these discussion points. Um, but I think there, there are two things that they were really underemphasizing. First is these empiricists and the generations of epistemologists they spawned. Um, they attended so much to how we might legitimately know things that they failed to fully account for the way that humans actually do have the experience of knowing things. Um, I kind of said this at the top, like there's a right way to know, but then there's like what actually people are doing. And as a sociologist, I'm very fascinated in what knowing is like for the individual experience of, of people, whether they're by themselves or within groups, which comes to the, the second big thing that I think they've underemphasized. Like many of Western civilization's philosophers, they really took the individual as their unit of analysis. And they wanted to know how a, an individual person, an individual mind in this little uh, atomized brain case could know anything. But there's, there's so much evidence and I, I almost just wanna state it and anyone can, uh, can debate me on this. <laughs> there's so much evidence that knowing whether we know correctly or not is an intensely social phenomenon. We definitely trust our, sense, our senses, we use our senses and we create um, different machinery to try to measure reality. But we also take other people's words for things. You know, I am a, I'm a sociologist. I believe that climate change is probably a man-made phenomenon and it's really problematic, but I am not the person who's done all of the measurements to know that for sure. I'm, I'm not quite taking it on faith, but I'm taking on authority of other people. Uh, and we do this all the time. Yeah, I mean, from the very beginning, when you're a kid, you just absorb what you're told. And that's how we know so much of what we know. And we consult books, we consult Wikipedia, we consult our closest friends. When we see something that is very strange in our experience, we actually question our senses. And we look to our friend and say, did you see that? Did you hear what they just said? Did I hear that right? Um, so the, the experience of knowing is one that comes through our senses, but it also, it comes from other people. Um, and that's, that's something we really need to understand to understand how we're in the position we are right now in the epistemological crisis that we're experiencing right now. So we've all gotten kind of a crash course on just how much these social forces can affect what we know and how we know it and what our compatriots know and how they know it. So this Q conspiracy, for instance, it lives because the people who believe it really support one another. They talk with one another, they party with one another, they discourage participation of non-believers or they try to convince people. Um, and each political party in this country is you know, experiencing similar dynamics. They live in their own apparently separate realities and this polarization has only been exacerbated by social media platforms that supply amplification to polarizing claims um, and the means for these ideological communities to separate themselves from one another. So th these social aspects of how we know um, have always been important, but, but now we're really seeing them in effect in a bad way. So I'm gonna bring these, all these threads together to try to explain our current crisis. Inductive reasoning about the world has always been difficult. You know, how do we test the truth value of a claim about the world? That's not just something we define. It's always been difficult. So philosophers, scientists, and epistemologists 
um, have been really focused on that, the optimal ways to perform inductive reasoning, but they've paid too little attention to the ways that, act, that people actually reason inductively. And so we've probably not spent enough effort to understand how people reason poorly and how to train people to respect and engage the challenge of induction, the challenge of amassing evidence for and against different, different propositions about the world. This has been the situation for decades, but now things are much worse. These social media companies actually make more money when their users engage with content. And here's this nasty secret about the truth, or at least claims that, you know, the repeated inductive testing have shown that they're very likely to be true. Here's the nasty secret about the, the truth or the near truth. It's boring uh, on social media. Like we apes really like novelty. We like controversy. We like conflict. It, it draws our attention. Um, and we may not actually like the feeling of outrage, but when we feel outrage, we are engaged and we start typing um, and we stick around on a web page and we do all we can to correct the stranger who is wrong on the internet. And while we're on those web pages, of course, a company can show us advertisement that might lead to purchases that pad their bottom line. So there's this whole economy, this atten attention economy that is um, actually amplifying the more ridiculous claims. So the, the, the too long didn't read, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'll, I'll say it one more time because I wanna, I wanna get to some plausible solutions. Um, induction is very hard. Like really, really knowing anything interesting about our actual world is very hard and perhaps technically impossible to, to achieve like a 100% certainty. Knowing is a social process. Most of us with the help of our peers, family, teachers and various institutions have mostly been doing it wrong. <laughs> for a long time, but now with social media, the incentives for doing it wrong have multiplied by an order of magnitude. And the ampli amplification of the worst stuff has multiplied even more. So the, the ensuing storms of misinformation, as we know, are dividing families, countries, and you know, I think it's very plausible uh, to claim that they probably resulted in the deaths of many thousands of people. So what do we do about it? Um, if we're gonna start thinking about solutions, we should keep in mind, this is a huge problem. So any proposed solutions have to really work at high scale. Uh, we know through social processes, um, um, we know that like knowing is a social process. So the solution will probably not look like just equipping individuals to tackle all these problems by themselves. Prob the solution probably needs to be somewhat of a social process. Um, and we know we're up against an extremely lucrative misinformation incentivizing, misinformation amplifying machine that operates across the internet and around the world. So it's not gonna be easy, but I do wanna offer some hope and I'm gonna show you a little bit of a tool that my team and I have been working on since 2015, even before fake news was a popular term. Um, it's a tool that empowers people to tackle the massive challenge of misinformation on the web. It's called Public Editor, and it literally allows members of the public through a social process to apply corrective labels to the most shared news articles driving our collective discourse. And, and then those news articles, since they're driving the collective discourse, um, when they're labeled, and it's clear what the misinformation is in those articles, hopefully more people are gonna to learn to discern different types of misinformation uh, and won't pass on so much of this junk stuff. So let me, uh, let me share my screen really quickly. I'm just gonna breeze through this. I'm looking at time and I'm realizing that I've kind of yammered a little bit more than I expected. So I'll give a, I'll give a quick intro and open up for Q and A and I can always like come back to some slides to show any details. So let me just jump in on that. Okay. Okay, so here's public editor. Um, and we are, we're an online community of critical thinkers, 
and we're sharing the most, we're, we're vetting the most shared news articles each day. So we have a service that tells us what stuff is spreading around on the internet. And then we're gonna go through and find all of the misinformation within those articles. Um, a nice upshot of this is that really when people read a, read a news article with these labels, they're getting kind of a passive education and media literacy. Anyone who annotates with us as a volunteer is getting like very intensive media literacy training. Um, and we can even kind of roll up these qualitative assessments into a, a quantifiable credibility score. And the great thing about that is uh, if you're a Facebook or a Twitter or even a government that wants to regulate the, the quality of information, it's nice to have a score. Um, if we wanna regulate the amount of arsenic in the meat <laughs> supply, you need to be able to measure arsenic in the meat supply. And we've actually developed a way to do that. A lot of great collaborators that we've been happy to work with. Um, and you know, this problem of fake news is not new, but we have this crazy information ecosystem now. It's really beautiful that any one of us can write a blog post and potentially reach a billion people. That's fantastic. But we don't have an editorial capacity that matches the, the number of authors that we now have. And each of us kind of gets to be a publisher. So we have these 2 billion amateur publishers out there just putting out whatever, um, whatever satisfies us. And of course, this is hurting our democracy. I, I, the big problem here from a technical standpoint is that computers can't really identify misinformation yet. We Some of us have heard of GPT-3 and like you can get computer to, to write an essay for you and stuff like that. But it's much harder for a computer to understand and analyze something than it is for a computer to try to mimic someone and generate text. And computers are not good at understanding metaphor, sarcasm, colloquialism, and certainly not the over 40 different types of argument and of fallacies, inferential mistakes, cognitive biases, and rhetorical trickery that we find with the public editor system. Um, so let me show you kind of what the end product looks like. We, here's here's a, a, a little news feed of a project we did looking at um, foreign disinformation campaigns. So imagine a newsfeed where next to each article, you have a sense of the credibility of the article, zero to 100, just like in our school system, how you graded things. And as you hover over any of this, you can see, oh, this one lost nine points for reasoning errors, seven points for errors having to do with how it talks about probability. And if I jump into one of these articles, now I'm reading a news article, just like I normally would, but there are these little underlines and actually tells me, oh, look, there's these little pockets here are creating kind of a manufactured scandal. We can see this in the credibility hallmark on the right, or we've got a slippery slope fallacy and, and a false dilemma at the same time. Um, I move down here and uh, we, we need something to be fact-checked. So we can do that with our fact-checking partners. We could probably do it ourselves, but we're trying to play nice with the fact-checkers out there. Here's some inappropriate slang. So this way, when someone's reading an article, you know, you read an article and something might seem a little fishy, but in what way is it fishy? In what way is it problematic? Public editor is gonna help you start to learn that. And you can explore all this in the credibility hallmark as well. So for each of these different categories of error, there are specific errors. I click on this and it'll take me right to the error in the article, um, which is pretty fun. This was fun to design. Um, so th that's what the end product looks like. Let me give you a sense of how we create that because I've told you it's not computers doing it by themselves. Um, and it's actually through a process that looks like this. We start with an article, a news article. Again, we're, we're grabbing any the articles that are being shared the most virally. So we make sure that we're covering a large proportion of the national news reader diet. Um, and the first stage, we go through two stages of annotation. In the first stage, someone's reading through the article and they're just looking for the formal elements of the article. If they're doing this piece of work, these colored boxes are, are different modules, different annotation modules in this assembly line of annotation modules. So these folks doing form triage, they're reading through an article, they're looking for the different arguments in the article. They're looking for the different quoted sources. These folks doing semantics triage, they're looking for these meaning elements. They're looking for any place that probability 
is used, you know, maybe this, certainly that. Um, they're looking for language issues, anything that might look like it could be a little biased or slanted. They're looking for any reasoning errors. And you all have heard of some of these. You've got your false dilemmas, your slippery slopes, things like that. And then they're looking for whether evidence is properly being used. So this really gets to induction, the challenge of induction. Does the evidence properly support the conclusions? Um, and what we do, you know, we look for the errors kind of on this side of the, of the system. And then if the error is, let's say it's in the primary argument of the article, then they might lose three points for that error, but then it gets multiplied by three because it was the primary argument of the article. Um, or maybe they lose three points because they have some very biased language, but it was coming from a source. It's coming from a quoted source that the author is actually trying to refute. So instead of the article losing three points for that, they might even gain a point because the article is refuting this very uh, biased language. Um, and I'll just show you what some of these tasks look like. Uh -oh. How do I get out of the screen? Right. Um, so I won't, I won't go into presentation mode, but I'm gonna show you what, what a semantics triage task looks like. And then I'm gonna show you what one of these language tasks looks like. So you can see how the stage one annotation feeds into the stage two annotation. Um, so here's a semantic triager and everything they need to know to do this task is right here in the interface. If you click on one of these labels, you have instructions for exactly how to apply that label. Um, so for the evidence label, we're looking for any, any place that data is used to support some claim. And I actually see like, here's something about a poll and 4.5 percentage points. For probability, we're looking for any place that there's any kind of probabilistic language so that someone else can you know, very carefully look at that and ensure that it's, this induction is being done properly. Um, and then for language, you know, we're looking for issues of tone and typos, poorly written stuff, ambiguous language, and, and certainly anything um, that is slanted or manipulative. And we see that one politician is calling another cult-like, which is, you know, that seems a little bit strong. It's not the job of this person, of this little group of annotators to make a final judgment, but they can pass it along to others who will take a closer look. So um, this is a very short demonstration article, but I could plausibly be done with this task right now that quickly. And next, each of those little units of text I highlighted, um, I highlighted one for probability and it would be sent along to people doing a probability task. I highlighted one for evidence, it'd be sent along to people doing evidence task. And then I highlighted some stuff for language, which will be sent along to a lang language task, which I show you right now. So we can see everything that I highlighted about being cult-like shows up here. Um, and I'm instructed to look for answers in the bold text at the left. This looks a lot like a reading comprehension quiz, which I'm sure many of us have taken hundreds or thousands of times. So we, we actually don't have to train people too much on this interface, but it does have some nifty features. Um, if it turns out your answer requires more context, you can actually drag this to the right and you can get all of the context of the entire article, but usually the answers are just gonna be found in that bold text that someone previously highlighted. Um, and one of the cool things we can do with these interfaces is we can kind of, we can ask as many questions about this as we want because we ask the questions one at a time and some questions only appear if they're relevant. Well, let me show you how that works. So I think there's some exaggeration in this text. And when I click exaggeration, I want you to notice a couple things. One, one is gonna happen up here, the other will happen down here. But let's look up here for a minute. When I click exaggeration, this number three appears. And that's actually another question in this queue of questions. So depending on how you answer questions, the, the interface will go deeper and ask you to answer follow-up questions. Um, so if I click on this, I can see the follow-up question and it, it's asking like how severe was the exaggeration? Um, but before I move on, I actually need to highlight the text that justifies my answer. This inkwell here is my cue. 
that I need to highlight what justifies my answer. And this way, we end up applying these labels to the actual text of the article. I click next. I decide, I think this is a considerable misrepresentation. There will be other people doing this very task. And some might say it's only some, or it's enormous, or it's minor. Since this is an ordinal scale from enormous to you know, totally non-problematic, it's, it's really easy to find a consensus just by averaging across these answers. We also deal with categorical data and the way that we find that consensus uh, is a little different when you're dealing with categorical data, but all of that happens kind of automatically so that uh, the results of all of this work, even though the work is done independently by individuals in these um, responding to these different protocols, everything gets stitched together very quickly. And uh, an entire article can be evaluated in less than 30 minutes by the system. Okay. Um, so that is public editor. And let me, let me kind of like put a little bit of a bow on my talking portion so that we can get into Q and A. Um, but first let me find the stop share button. Okay, great. Um, so with public editor, we're attacking this problem of misinformation by getting people together. Uh, we are formalizing an epistemological process, uh, a social epistemological process that also ends up training people. Both our annotators intensively, but, but news readers in a passive way to be better at recognizing the various ways that we as humans, when we're attempting indu inductive reasoning, which is so hard, we kind of foul ourselves up yeah, intentionally or not. You know, th there's so many ways that we that we get this reasoning wrong. And now we have a way through the system public editor to actually identify all those ways and to turn all of those problems, all that problematic misinformation into learning opportunities for people. Um, wait, wait, there's more. Uh, what's something that's pretty neat about the system that I'm excited about doing going forward is handing the system to different communities. Um, Everyone, I think, believes that we have been ideologically polarized. There are different ideological communities across the country, and we can point at them and, and we know their names. What I'm really interested in is, are there different epistemological communities? It's the way that these communities know different from one another. Um, you know, maybe Republicans respond more to these appeals to authority, or maybe not. Maybe it's just that people on the left have different authorities that they appeal to. Um, maybe uh, people on the left are more prone to like believe in false dilemmas. We don't know this, um, but we can give a tool like this to different communities and see how they use it, see how they see what they see in the same content um, and start to learn a little bit about that. Finally, um, a project that I'm really excited about and I'll just mention is a teaming up public editor with a group called the Society Library. So public editor finds the misinformation in content. What the Society Library does is it takes the information within content and it restructures it. It kind of breaks everything down to the, the root claims within some set of documents. And then it reorganizes them up uh, claims, like coalesce into arguments for or against positions in relation to some question um, about some topic. So claims, arguments, positions, question, topic. And you can build up a knowledge graph where you can trust that everything in that knowledge graph is going to be valid because it's the misinformation has been filtered out by public editor and it's been reconstructed um, in this way where you can kind of traverse it by the claim or by the question. Um, we think this is gonna be especially valuable in training AI. Everyone's heard garbage in, garbage out. And we have, we keep hearing about these AI models like, oh, so-and-so created this chat robot. And within two hours, it was like a flaming racist because it's trained on this garbage data. Um, but if we, what we're trying to do is create a system that's, that's valid in, valid out. Um, everything in the model of, of 
everything in the knowledge model for a particular topic is going to be valid. And then when you have a computer draw on that, it's actually gonna provide really useful information. So these are some of the ways that we're trying to attack this at scale. I really appreciate everyone's patience. I feel like I've gone a little bit long, but I hope there's a really uh, lively set of questions and discussion. Um, let me stop now and, and ask our moderators to jump in. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, can everyone please unmute and give a round of applause? <laughs>